Welcome to spring break weekend, also leap forward weekend, also we had nowhere to go, so we're here, all right? Yay, not Colorado. Yay, everybody. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. If we haven't met, and there's probably not new people, we have. But if we haven't, hey, I'm going to hang out right down there after the service. I'd love to meet you. Come say hi, even if it's been a while. Uh, welcome to Crossroads. As we get into the sermon this morning, we're going to dive right in. A lot to cover. There's a phrase that we say at the beginning of every sermon to reset our hearts in alignment with what God is doing. It is when we recognize that the work of the Spirit works differently than our world outside these doors. That so often we live in a critical world where our first step is to judge the actions of others. But the work of the Spirit, the work of sanctification, the work of Christiformity and Christlikeness is oftentimes beginning within us. And so we say this phrase, the move of the Spirit is inward to conviction, not outward to critique. And we say that not just to have a phrase that we like every week, but hopefully to realign our hearts and to simply get us to ask the question, what is God trying to teach me this morning as we open the scripture? Because every time we open his word, he speaks to us. And so might we ask that question as we go through our text in Matthew 16 today? Let me lead us in a prayer kind of to get our hearts in the right place and we'll dive in. Pray with me. God, I'm thankful that we can be here We can gather with others that know that God is worthy of worship in a busy world that we can stop down and recognize that Jesus is worth our time, our energy, our affection. So Holy Spirit, I pray against all the distractions of the world today. So for the next few minutes while we're together, while we are together, we can focus on what you're doing and know that you're good and that you care. If you're comfortable, just take a few seconds and say a silent prayer and just Ask that the Spirit of God might speak to your spirit this morning and encourage and edify and allow us to see what God is doing. I ask you to pray for me. That God might use my preparation to do something far greater than I could do. I need his help each and every day. As we open the text, I pray that the Holy Spirit uses the words to his good and his advantage that we might grow together. Pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. There's this quote that I've liked in the past and it's kind of going to shade how we see our text this morning. It's my toll story. I'll put it on the screen for you. It says, The most difficult subjects can be explained to the most slow-witted man if he has not formed any ideas of them already. But the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he's firmly persuaded that he already knows, without a shadow of a doubt, that which is laid before him. Let me give you an example that's embarrassing of me. We ready? Okay, cool. Uh, So growing up, I took grammar, I went to private school because my parents cared. I did all the things you're supposed to do. Uh, I say that joke all the time. And then I got to college and I went to, you know, a Bible college, liberal arts college, meaning that we didn't do a lot of math at Moody. Seven, God is good, yay, you passed, you know. And so we did a lot of writing. And I thought for about the first 20-ish years of my life that the word so was like the word to when used as an adverb. You know what that means? So when I say something is too big, there's another O thrown on the end of two. I thought the same thing happened with the word so. So for about two decades, every time I wrote I would use so like that. I literally remember getting papers back in high school and college where the teachers marked it off and I thought in my head, how can they teach and be this dumb? I'm right there wrong. (laughs) 
I remember saying out loud like they don't know grammar. Oh my goodness, that's so embarrassing for them, said the 18-year-old arrogant Chuck, you know? And then I remember where I was when I found out that I was wrong. I was, I was on, in my dorm at Moody, and I was chatting with somebody on Instant Messenger. That's right, everybody. And, and they said, why do you always do that? And I said, because I'm right <laughs> all the time. And, uh, and they said, no, you're not. And I said, what do you mean I'm not right? And then in a moment, I realized that it took 20 years to convince me that I was wrong, and I had a pride problem. Um, but also that I had formed a concept of something that couldn't be walked back, and it took a lot to get me to see what was actually true because I thought I knew I was right. It goes along with this quote that we say often by Thoreau, we hear and apprehend only what we already half know, the truism, I'll believe it when I see it, might be better stated, I'll see it when I believe it. And it's true of us. Today we're going to talk about two stories of people interacting with Jesus. And the tragedy and the travesty of these stories is they completely miss what God is doing because of how they're looking at Jesus in the first place or, in the second story, how they're looking at themselves. And this is true not just for grammatical senses, but it's also true in the world we live in. Studies have shown from Ohio State University, for example, that about um, half of the wrongful convictions in our court systems are because of eyewitness testimony. The Innocence Project deals with this all the time. They found that like 69% of the cases they try that are actually disproven by DNA evidence were convicted in the first place because somebody said, I saw it. Eyewitness testimony can be good, but can also be very misleading because your brain does some things and it thinks it sees something. And so today what we talk about is two groups of people, a religious elite group and the disciples themselves, and how they think they see Jesus, because how we see changes what we see of God's activity. That's why our vision statement at CBC is to see and share the goodness of God. If you don't know how you see, it's a discipline. You'll never see God rightly or correctly. And so our story today centers around two ways. It's so often we miss God because we look through the lens of first, cynicism, and second, shame. So we're in Matthew 16, starting in verse 1. I'll read the first verse and we'll talk about it. Now when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to see Jesus, they tested him. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And a couple things we need to note here that are contextually relevant is Matthew says the Pharisees and the Sadducees came together to test Jesus. So a couple things we already know. One is both these people, especially the Sadducees, which lived in the temple area, came from the south up north to test Jesus. Two is that these people hated each other. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were two conflicting groups of religious elite. The Sadducees are old money. The Pharisees are new money. The Sadducees didn't believe that any scripture was God-breathed outside of the first five books, which meant they didn't believe in prophecy. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in angels and demons, and the Pharisees all did, and they fought over it. The Sadducees were much more strict in interpreting the Old Testament law to the point where that verse that says an eye for an eye, they actually lived that out, you know, literally. And the Pharisees had a wider interpretation because they used what's called the Mishnah or the oral law that was handed down with the rest of the Old Testament to interpret the Old Testament texts. They hated each other. And you can say, well, how can two people who love the same God hate each other? Well, welcome to the world, everybody, you know? And so when it says that they came together and approached Jesus, that's a powerful statement of one, their vitriol towards Jesus, and two, what they were trying to do. This reminded me of, uh, there's a commercial, it's a sports thing. There's a commercial several years ago, one of my favorites of all times, and it starts with this couple on the couch, and they're, you know, like making out or something, you know, and then it slowly pans out, and as it pans out, this ESPN commercial, as it pans out, and they're saying things like, I love you, I can never live without you, I'm so happy right now, one of them is wearing an Ohio State sweatshirt, and one of them is wearing a Michigan sweatshirt, you know, and then the tagline says, is brilliant, without sports, this wouldn't be disgusting, you know, <laughs> it's brilliant marketing, <laughs> I've never forgotten it. This is what's happening here. <laughs> like you're, you're looking at these two kinds of groups approaching Jesus saying, this is not right. This doesn't make sense. And the only place you can go there is, man, how much must they really, really hate Jesus to both come and say they want the same thing, which is they said, we want a sign from heaven. And we got to stop there just for a second. 
They said, give me a sign from heaven. And if you're an Old Testament scholar like they were, you probably initially went back to Elijah and Mount Carmel when literally he tested Baal and Jezebel and said, hey, my God can consume the altar that's dripping wet. And so literally fire rained down from heaven in the Old Testament to prove in that moment that his God was bigger and better and more real than their God. That's what they're referencing. And so they say, we need a sign from heaven because here's the deal. Jesus had been healing. He had been prophesying. He had been teaching with authority. And they came to him and they said it wasn't enough. And his response in the next verse is, you're a wicked and adulterous generation that asks for a sign. And we have to do some work here. I feel like if we get this out of context, it does damage to who God is and how he treats his people. So the, the idea of a sign in this kind of text or Jesus proving who he is, if you read this the wrong way, you can get the implication that God hates it when we challenge him, that God hates it when we doubt, that God hates it when we genuinely come before him and say, please give me an understanding. I don't have one. The problem with that theory from this text is the rest of the Bible. Throughout the Old Testament specifically, God shows up and shows out to prove himself to all his people. From Adam walking in the garden to Moses in the desert in the bush and the snake and all the things that God did for them to the Old Testament when he gave them 10 plagues and he probably really only needed one to prove he was good to Gideon and the fleece to Ahaz and Hezekiah. God continually showed himself to his people that genuinely asked, please give me a sign. What we see in scripture is overwhelmingly a God who loves to prove himself to the people who love him. What this can't be is a text that we use as a proof text to say, don't ask the hard questions. That's an affront to God if you don't trust him initially. That's not what's happening here. And furthermore, I think all creation shows us that God loves to show his strength and power to his people. That is why the universe exists. That we're just now realizing is far bigger and far more complex and far more majestic and awe-inspiring than we ever thought it could possibly be. I think all this points to the idea that God loves and cherishes the places and the points in our life when he gets to show us who he is, how much he loves us, and how strong he is. He doesn't tire of those things. Whenever my kids ask me to prove how much I love them or how strong I am, I never let that go by, you know? Because for the most part, nobody looks at me like I'm strong except my two-year-old son, you know? <laughs> but, but it's more than that. It's I, I take delight and joy in proving to my kids how much they're cared for and how much I can protect them and how much I love them. Why would we think God doesn't do the exact same thing? He does all through Scripture. And what Jesus does here, especially in verse 3 when he quotes about the sky and clouds, what he's doing is revealing the motive of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They didn't ask to see. They didn't ask so that their minds might be changed. They didn't come with an unbiased expectation that were tests there, literally is the word that Satan used in the temptation of Jesus. They asked so that Jesus might fail. They aren't looking for a reason to believe. They aren't trying to grapple with the doubts in their faith. They're trying to disprove Jesus, and they're looking for a reason to support their unbelief. And Jesus sees their motive. He sees that they want him to fail, and they will only acknowledge his miracles as miraculous if he does fail. One writer said this, miracles will give confirmation where there is faith, but not where there is willful unbelief. I saw a debate between uh, William Lane Craig, who's an apologist and uh, a leading agnostic. And the, <laughs> William Lane Craig asked the agnostic, like, what would it take for you to believe in God? And he said, if, and then he goes on like a minute diatribe, if the heavens open and the trumpets sound and I see God and God looks at me and he lists this thing, and then and only then if that happens, I will believe in your God. And William Lane Craig stops and he looks at him and he says, you just won't think that's a hallucination? <laughs> and the atheist said, I probably would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? It's, it's that idea that we will go out of our way to believe what we already think we've seen. And you got to understand, in this context, Jesus is pointing 
out what they know they think is true and they won't move off it. And so verse three, when he talks about the clouds, he's simply saying like, you, you see the sky and you can make interpretations based on that, based on your society and agrarianism. And it has to do with his shepherds, like when the sun would rise in the west, if you saw a tinge of red, that means clouds were coming. And so it's probably gonna rain. And at nighttime, if you saw a clear sky, that means it probably wasn't going to be rain. And they use that to judge whether these are good or bad. We have those all the time. My family is from Iowa, and we grow corn. And by we, I mean the collective, definitely not me, but we grow corn. And they would say knee-high by the 4th of July is a good crop, you know? We do the same thing. So he's saying, you all the time believe in signs that you see, but you don't believe in my sign because your mind has already been made up. And so he looks at them and he says, you're an evil and a wicked generation. And then he keeps on going. And he said, no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. And I want to hit this real quick because I just think it's fascinating. When it says the sign of Jonah, I think it, it means two things. One is, if you read Matthew 12, he says the same phrase as they ask for a sign again, different kind of sign, but it's just the Pharisees. And he says, hey, you're going to get the sign of Jonah. And he extrapolates on that. He says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man, you know, keep going. So clearly the resurrection. But also what I find fascinating about this and why I think it's important for us is because when we try to prove Jesus to people, I think we do it one way, not the other way. I think we prove Jesus by saying, look at the miracles or that he rose from the dead. And that's good, great, and grand. I think that's true. But the other half of the sign of Jonah is that he went to Gentile people and they repented. The other half of the sign of Jonah is that God brought about change in a Gentile and enemy territory where their hearts were set against God. It's a fulfillment of Psalm 22. The ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh. Jesus quotes the beginning of this on the cross, actually. He says, all the families of the nation will worship before you. The sign of Jonah is not just the resurrection, but the repentance by the rest of the world. And why I think that's important is for about the first seven or 800 years of the Christian movement, church fathers pointed to the expansion of the movement of Jesus as proof that Jesus was true in the first place. You know that? In Acts chapter 5, there's an example of one of the leading priests in the day, and they come to uh, the the leading uh, Pharisee, And they say, hey, what about this movement of Jesus' followers? Should we stamp it out? And and this guy wisely says, if you remember the story, Gamaliel, Gamaliel, I got that wrong. You can look it up yourself, right? Uh, He said, uh, hey, let's wait. And he said, look, if this is of man, it will fail like they all have. But if this is of God, I can't stop it and neither can you. So what I want to do for the next like three minutes as a small aside is, and we've done this before, but I don't think we can do this enough, is simply come together and look at how the movement of God has spread beyond ways that we could expect to show that Jesus was true when he said he was actually going to do the things he was going to do. So every year, uh, Gordon Conwell puts out kind of a state of Christianity in, in a global sense. And they said a couple things. I'm going to throw some numbers at you. They said, according to a survey by Pew Research, there's 600 million Christians in the world in in 1910. And there's 2.2 billion in 2010. That's good growth. And if you think that it's because just there's more people there are, are, but the world's population grew at 1.2% and Christianity grew at 1.31% in that same time. They said, particularly in the West, the church might not be growing as much as you think, but in the East, it's growing way faster than you can believe. It says that the growth rate for non-religious is less than half than what it used to be, 0.52%, well below the total population growth percentage. In particular, the number of atheists is almost stagnant, growing at 0.18% per year. They say there was less atheists around today than was in 1970. All this is to say that when Jesus said, you'll get a sign, it's the sign of Jonah, I'm going to raise from the dead, and you can't stop my rebellion against the evilness of this world. Believe me, it's happened. And so we take confidence in a Jesus that said, hey, I'm winning this fight. A couple of maps I want to show you because maps are fun. We've used these before. Uh, one, and this is, I think really particularly interesting, when you compare the growth of Christianity to growth of other religions, Christianity is, is really the only one that doesn't have an epicenter. And that means something. 
Most religions, when they grow, they grow out of a place to other places. There's a a stronghold in a particular part of the world. Christianity, seemingly, what Jonah did, what Jesus is saying, the sign of Jonah grew all places, called all people, and made all Gentiles, if you want to use those words in quotes, repent more than any other religion ever has. There's another one. This focuses on the places where Christianity is huge, and just look at all the big circles or concentrations. It's all over the world. Global Christianity is doing quite well. And I say that to say this, if all you take away this morning is that God is winning, it's a good Sunday, everybody, you know? If all you take away is that Jesus was right when he said that I will rise from the dead and you can't stop what I'm doing, that's a good Sunday, everybody. And for hundreds of years, that's what people used to prove that Christianity was true. That's what people used to say, hey, see, what he said was actually legitimate because his movement is continuing to grow. When you get back into the text a little bit, fun diatribe, we all have a good time? Cool. Uh, When you get back into the text a little bit, what you have to do is really get down to the question of why in the first place did the Pharisees and the Sadducees really, really not see what Jesus wanted them to see? And you got to understand what they wanted. We talk about this often. You got to understand what they wanted out of Jesus. They came from a people group that had been oppressed for a very, very long time. There was revolts after revolt after revolt. Rome was a mean oppressor to them. They hurt them and they took all their money. And Israel kept hearing stories about one day, hundreds of years ago, when they ran the world. And that's all they wanted again, especially the Sadducees who loved political power. And they thought their God was going to come back and give it back to them. And then Jesus shows up. And instead of giving power back, he says things like, forgive those who've hurt you and turn the other cheek and walk a mile in their shoes He does things like heal Gentiles and Roman centurions, kiddos, and servants' kids. He does crazy things that don't align with the expectation of the Sadducees to regain the power and the place that they love. He he creates a worldview and a kingdom that they never thought would be possible. And so every time he does it, this is why you see the mounting aggression of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Every time Jesus heals in a way that doesn't meet their expectation, every time he breaks the Levitical law according to the oral law, which is the the mission when he heals on the Sabbath or he walks too far or he, he breaks a grain of rice on the Sabbath, every time he does those things, their expectations are unmet just a little bit more. And so at this point, we're two years in to fully unmet expectations. He's growing more and more popular and they're going deeper and deeper into their just frankly, anger with the world that Jesus is trying to create because it doesn't meet any kind of their expectation of what Messiah should be. And this is where you get cynicism that comes in. So cynicism is when our unmet expectations turn into pain and that pain turns into distrust and that distrust turns into the inability to trust again. It's when unmet expectation after unmet expectation makes me believe that I can't trust you and then farther enough down the road, it makes me believe that there's nothing you can do to make me ever trust you again. Let's look at the political party system in our country, you know? You failed me and you failed me and you failed me. And so now there's nothing I can do and nothing you can do to make me trust you again. It's somebody after they end a really hard relationship for the first month and a half, you know? There are studies out there from the last couple years that say, that out of four out of every 10 unchurched person, let's turn to church hurt, four out of every 10 unchurched person is unchurched because the church hurt them in some capacity. They have lost their ability to see the church as a source of good in the world. And look, there's baggage on both sides of that conversation, believe you me. But the point is there's cynicism that surrounds their ability to see Jesus for who he is. There's cynicism, I think, that surrounds so many of us. We have missed expectations of Jesus. I love what one theologian said, the faith that holds the soul also rules uh, one's perception. And that's just true. So one of the questions we have to continually ask is where is God not meeting my expectations and what am I doing in that space? Am I allowing cynicism to grow? Because here, here's one thing I know to be true. Every time, Something doesn't go our way. And every time we have a missed expectation of God, whether it's an unanswered prayer or whether it's a tragedy or whether it's just a day-to-day, I'm not feeling it this morning because I lost an hour and, you know, your trust in God will either grow or your cynicism will grow. One of two things. And so 
Jesus meets these Pharisees and Sadducees well down the road of cynicism to the place where they can't see what God is doing right in front of them because they've already decided. And it's tragic. And I wish I could say that we're far off from this, but we're shallow cuts every day from bleeding out, if you know what I'm talking about, you know? Like, I'm not too far from believing that one day I won't be cynical. I don't want to be. That's why community is good. That's why gathering spaces with other believers is good. It resets our expectations, not around what we want, but who God is and his character. It grows our trust in those places of temptation or those places of tragedy where trust is so often taken away and turned into a grudge against God. That's why we need one another to fight the cynicism that slowly creeps in and then causes our ability to see God to diminish and then one day end altogether. There's a video I saw this week that someone sent me. I have, uh, like anybody else, I have church crushes. Do you guys know what that is? I'm a pastor. So I have churches that I like have a teenage crush on, you know? And when uh, COVID hit, and we were all at home, there's this church that I would found the John Mark Comer, I'd quote him all the time. Um, he had a church up in Portland. And then when COVID hit, I was like, well, I'm going to watch this church on Sunday mornings because two reasons. One, I knew what I'd already said on our broadcast. And, and two, I thought it was just a scotch narcissistic to be like, family gather around and watch dad on the TV, you know? So <laughs> I decided to fight that and watch another church. And so I'd watch Bridgetown. And I got into it, and, and then we've taken the staff up there for a conference. It's good stuff. A lot of the practice rhythms that we're getting into, practice the way, comes from Comer about disciplines and how we know that the discipled life is the disciplined life. It's beautiful. I love the direction that we're going in, that they go in. And, and recently, John Mark Comer left, and this guy Tyler Statton took over, and um, he seems young-ish, younger than me, so, you know, probably like 19. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and he told his church a couple weeks ago that he just got diagnosed with cancer, and we're going to drop a link, I think, in the, in the chat if you want to see it. But it's a 20-minute video on his response, and it's beautiful. It's a 20-minute video on how this didn't probably meet with where he thought he was going to be and what God was doing, but how he's trusting God in it, how he's going to learn from God through it. It's a beautiful depiction of what it looks like to drop our expectations and trust God in the middle of tragedy and pain and when, you know, his works don't match up with what we think his work should be. And in a culture that causes you to believe that God wants the best for your life, sometimes it's difficult when it seems like the best isn't happening. Sometimes it's difficult to preach the passages that talk about us suffering and us hurting. And so it's a beautiful depiction of, of what trust looks like in saying, I will choose to see through the cynicism that's easy and lazy beyond that into the God that I know to be true and, and trust his character, even if his works don't line up with my expectation. That's the battle of the Pharisees. It's Palm Sunday. It's what we're going to get into. It's our battle every day is to look and see the goodness of God. We say it each and every week because it's so vitally important to our trust in a God that's good and loving and kind and working. And so the first relationship, the first cause we see of not seeing God move is when distrust is slowly bred over time, when the expectations aren't meant, it turns into full-fledged cynicism where now I can't believe or trust anything that you're saying is good or right. That's so tragic because he's been healing and he's been restoring and he's been feeding and they come to him again and they say, I still know you're going to fail me. Give me a sign. He says, you just don't get it, do you? It's so sad when people miss God standing right in front of them. And then through the disciples, you're probably thinking, yeah, dum-dums, like how can you do this? And then the writer turns his attention on them. Look at verse 5. He says, when the disciples went to the other side, so Jesus says, I'm leaving you guys. And actually, he leaves uh, that part of Israel for the last time before he makes his um, journey into Jerusalem for the Passion Week. It's just like the last straw with the religious elite. When Jesus' his disciples went to the other side, this three-verse arc is amazing for a lot of reasons. It says that when they went to the other side, they forgot bread, you know? And what I love about that phrase is if you've been following along, you know that bread's played a pretty key player in our narrative so far. Twice he's fed 5,000 and 4,000 dudes, so probably about 15 to 20,000 and 12 to 15,000 people total. And it says when the disciples went to the other side, they forgot to take the bread. And here's what's going to happen in the next couple verses 
is that moment of failure is going to absolutely change how they see everything that happens next. That's what we call shame. Guilt is when you can lead it moment by moment. Shame is when something happens and you carry it with you and it changes the next moments, for example. So I was in this basketball league uh, these last few months and I hadn't played basketball in a very long time. I was never the best. I was never the worst. I was fine. I could hold my own ish. I played basketball for the first time in like eight years. I realized something. I cannot hold my own ish. I was absolutely horrible. The first three minutes of the first game, I got knocked out and I got concussed and I really didn't come back. And it didn't get better from there the rest of the season, you know? It's that country song, like I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm, I was not good once as I ever was. It was very bad. And because that was part of my identity growing up, I remember like I, my, these people on my team are friends, like they're friends, you know? They're good friends. And after games, they'd say things like, hey, man, it's not that bad. Or, you know, we, we kind of lost and won together. Or I couldn't literally believe that they actually cared for me for about 24 hours afterwards because I did such a bad job, you know? What, what happens with the disciples here is they leave some bread. And you see in the next verse, Jesus is trying to talk to them. And their experience and their felt, their felt like shame of leaving the bread kind of shows them how they or helps them interpret what Jesus says next. So the writer says, they left, they left some bread. And he says that because Matthew says in verse 6, Jesus said, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And this is your clear miscommunication. This is, uh, Jesus is trying to teach them something, but they left some bread and they can't leave that behind. So in the Old Testament specifically, when it says, beware of the yeast and the Pharisees, yeast was something small that affected all things. In the biblical narrative, usually it's synonymous with evil. And so they'd say, hey, watch out for yeast because it's very tiny, but it grows and grows and grows and then affects everything. So Jesus is saying, watch out for the evil of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Watch out for all their cynicism because it could catch up with you and before you know it, affect you. That you might not believe that what I am and what I do is good for you. And so this is how the disciples responded to his teaching. So they began to discuss among themselves saying, it's because we brought no bread, you know? <laughs> they said, we lost the bread, we left it there. And Jesus said, hey guys, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they said, he knows it. We lost the bread. He hates us. Jesus hates me. Jesus hates me. I left bread. They just don't like it. I made that up right now. Oh my goodness. Watch out, Andy, you know? It's this moment when you realize that what Jesus is trying to teach them isn't being heard. What Jesus is doing isn't being seen because they can't get over their past mistakes. It's shame 101. I love what Brene Brown, who like is the guru of shame, writes about it. So shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience that, and believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Shame says you're unacceptable, unloving, and unworthy. Go on to say that guilt is a moment and shame spills to all the moments. Guilt says I deserve to be punished and shame says I am worthless. You know, it's heartbreaking. So my daughter is in the shame place. I think all kids go through it. But she'll get in trouble for like eating something or disobeying. And instead of being like, I shouldn't have done that, she, de she like devolves into I'm a terrible person and a horrible daughter, you know? And every time that happens, my heart just breaks. No, 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 no. How did we go from zero to 120 so quickly? Back the emotional train up, you know? But she doesn't see the difference because she's so engrossed by, encapsulated by shame. There's a Lifeway Research Department, and Scott McConnell is the director of it. And he says in his research that shame is a huge player in our culture where everybody's on all the time. That more than ever before, shame is something a currency our culture trades in. He says that women are twice as likely to experience it. Teenagers are five times as likely to experience shame. He draws a correlation between shame and depression and anxiety. And he says that social media has a detrimental effect on shame. He did a study where he surveyed 1,000 people, 1,000 people, and he said, what's our biggest cultural fear? And they said, shame. And then he asks them these questions. Out of these 1,000 people, he said... Um, what are your feelings about fear, shame, and guilt? And he says, out of those feelings, fear, shame, and guilt, which of these do you seek to avoid the most? And the number one answer was shame. That we deal with something that absolutely causes us to see through a certain lens that might not be true because we can't divorce the action from the person. And we can't divorce, like, I, I made a mistake here, and now all God looks at and sees is the worst moment of me. 
So we might live, not live in an honor-shame culture, but we, we live in a shameful culture where what's online defines you in the worst possible way. And for the disciples, what it did was it, it literally caused them to miss what Jesus is saying. He said, hey, watch out for their insidious evil is what it would have been heard like in the first century. Because it's like a cancer. It's going to grow. It's a good analogy for, for yeast in, in to the disciples. And they respond with, it's because we forgot the bread. They completely missed what God was doing. Let me give you two reasons why I think shame is causing us to miss God. One, and we see it in our text, shame causes us to only see what we lack instead of what God has provided and what he is providing. So in the next couple of verses, I'll read them to you. I'm going to read these verses several times. He says, why are you arguing among yourselves about having no bread? <laughs> so they say, we left the bread. He says, watch out for the yeast. And he says, why are you talking about bread, you know? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up and the seven loaves for the 4,000? How many baskets you took up? How could you not understand that I was, speak- I was not speaking to you about bread? So literally this comes off of two stories where God used bread to make a whole lot more bread. And in the middle of their shame, they totally forgot what God was provided for them and how he was going to continually provide. Because shame causes us it, it, it makes an inability for us to see past ourselves into anything good or worthy or of value. And so because they were filled with shame, they literally couldn't see what God had provided and what he was providing in that moment. Had provided bread, was providing instruction on how to like not lose their faith and devolve into cynicism. And then two, I think shame causes us to misinterpret the care of God for the consternation of God. Instead of like, I'm... I'm just not somebody who steals candy. I'm a horrible person, and you probably hate me. And so how we see, if we kind of look through that lens, is how you read the next verses. So I think if if we have a, a shame issue, you probably heard the verses like this. You who have such little faith, why are you arguing among yourselves about having no bread? Do you not understand? Do you not remember the loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Or the loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? How could you not understand that I was not speaking about bread? You know? But what if Jesus didn't say it like that? What if Jesus wasn't being mean, but he was trying to be merciful? What if he was concerned for his disciples that they missed a teaching moment and he really cared for them not falling away and not missing all that he had for them? What if he said it like this? You who have such little faith, why are you arguing among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves and the five thousands and how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves and the four thousands and how many baskets you took up? How could you not understand that I was not speaking about bread, but just please beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? What if his response wasn't mean, but was merciful, but their shame couldn't see it? So often, so often, so often when we think of God or hear from God or read our scripture, we read it from a lens of shame. Shame causes us not to focus on on the sufficiency of Christ, but rather focus on our deficiencies. We can't start seeing God when we can't stop focusing on our failure. Biblical shame always leads towards the big picture of God's provision because shame is the wrong story. Guilt and shame, everyone who uses those words, might have a moment in the gospel story, but it always stops with the next phrase, which is, but God. It always starts with identity rooted in the grace of God. It always starts with a celebration of how deeply you are loved by God. And if guilt and shame doesn't do that, it's having too much of a hold on your life and your identity. It deepens our joy and our understanding of God's grace. That's the role of shame in the life of the believer, and that's it. We're going to gather here in a couple weeks and talk about Good Friday. And we're going to talk about in detail uh, what Jesus did and how he went to the cross and how he was beaten and how he was bleeding and how he was bruised for you and for me. And we don't do that because we're masochists. We do that because it makes the celebration on Sunday better. It makes the celebration on Sunday richer. It causes us to scream a little louder, to clap a little more, to sing a little bit, to put maybe two hands up halfway at CBC, everybody on Easter, you know? What shame does is it causes us to not see past ourselves, and so we can't see what God is doing 
right here and right now. That's why at CBC, one of our values is grace is our guide. Might that be the lens, the filter which we look through, not shame, because of what Jesus has already done. God met you to make you, he met you where you are to make you into more of who Jesus is, and he takes pleasure and joy in that process. It's Ephesians 2.10, that you are his workmanship, his masterpiece, that he is working on and working through so that people might see that he is good. But so often we can't see what God is doing because our shame blinds us to anybody but our failure. So cynicism operates in a false expectation of how God has let me down and shame operates in a false narrative that God's response is based on how I've let him down. And they both cause us to miss and to fail to see the goodness of God right in front of us, the movement of God right in front of us, the presence of Jesus that's right here in our midst. And so to hear God, (laughs) to hear God, you have to trust that his ways are right if your expectations aren't met. You have to trust that his grace is big enough in the middle of your failure. Because if you don't do those two things, you won't see it. And so this morning... When we talk about how we see and how we hear and how we interpret Jesus' actions and rightfully see what God is doing all along the way, we have the two questions of where are we drawn into cynicism or distrust that's deep, that makes me not trust God, and where is our shame causing us to look inward and not at what Jesus has already done for us? Where can we not see beyond ourselves? So let me give you two helpful places to go, because I think this tension is probably both that we deal with on an ongoing basis if we're honest with ourselves. So this week, if you're struggling with cynicism, turn to Psalm 62. Let me read you a little bit of it. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He's my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Might we battle the cynicism in our soul by repeating the truth that we know that God is our refuge and our strength and he's fighting for us, even when our expectations are unmet. And if we struggle with shame, let me phrase that differently, we struggle with shame And a good verse to go to is Ephesians 3, 17 to 21. I'm going to read it for you and then go back this week and read. He says, this is my prayer for you. Being rooted and established in love, may you have the power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge and understanding that you may be filled to the measure with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to immeasurably do more than we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I believe what Thoreau said, that we're half-hearted people and that we believe what we half know. I just hope that what we half know is that God is good all the time. I hope that what we half know is that God is gracious all the time. I hope that what we half know is that God is working to do something far bigger and better than just deliver you from Rome in that context. Because what they missed was the bigger picture of God. That he came to set souls free from all their bondage, not just their one oppressor. What they missed was that God was doing something much bigger than could be contained by a simple city in northern Galilee. What, what they missed was that the work of God is for all people in all time and all places because he is redeeming and restoring. What they missed was the goodness of God for all the people of God. What they missed was Jesus' movie. So might we be a people with the half that we know to be true is that God is good to you and me. That God is so gracious. Might that cause us to look through the lens of cynicism and shame and only see what God is up to. And we can't trust that. We have a people all around us who will yell right at you and say, God is good. Might that be our prayer this morning? Let me pray. God, I'm thankful and trusting that you are good. I'm thankful and trusting that your grace is enough. I'm thankful and trusting that we can be a people that even when it's hard to see, see that you're moving. Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see it. The goodness of God in all places. Give us an ability to overcome our capacity for doubt, to understand that you are big and great and good, and give us an inexplainable joy in the middle of this world on why we have hope, because you are a God who heals, 
You are a God who's gracious and you are a God who is redeeming and restoring. That's the mission and the work of Jesus. And might we be a church that sees it. We pray these things in his name. Amen.